Hi, everyone. I'm Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today. I've been a space and astronomy journalist for over 20 years. I like to bring you behind the scenes, talk to the scientists, the researchers coming up with the clever ideas that we're reporting on at Universe Today. Today, I'm Dr. I'm, I'm Dr. I'm, do, I'm joined. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Ashish Gol. Dr. Gol, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to talk to you about LCRT. Yeah. So who are you? What do you do? Yeah, so uh, my name is Ashish Koel. I'm a robotics technologist at NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Um, I've been working at JPL since 2018. Um, and so in my, uh, in my main job is working on different robotics projects and uh, ideas and concepts for future missions. And on this Lunar Crater Radio Telescope project, I've I do have some background in physics and astronomy and cosmology, so I've been kind of trying to marry some of those interests of mine with some of the robotic concepts that are needed to make this mission a possibility. Yeah, it's interesting. I looked uh, sort of I looked through your your history and your background, and it is quite diverse. A lot of different projects that you've that you've worked on, and somehow you got sucked into being the primary author on the most recent version of the Lunar Crater Observatory. So, um, yeah, it's, it's strange. I'm, I'm not a cosmologist by training in any space in, in any rigid way. Um, I just had a lot of interest. I've always had a lot of interest in astronomy and cosmology. I did in my undergrad, I did quite a lot of work on solar physics, uh, predicting the behavior of sunspots and things like that. So I've always had a lot of interest in this field. Uh, but then when I started working at JPL, uh, the PI of the project is uh, Saptarshi Bandhyopadhyay, who's a colleague of mine in the robotics section as well. Um, so when I found out that he was uh, starting this project, uh, it was like a perfect opportunity for me to kind of combine these interests. And I've kind of taken up more of the uh, science responsibility, trying to really understand what the science requirements for such a telescope would be and how those translate into engineering requirements uh, it, because it is interesting the, and, and you know we'll get into this but <clears throat> i think having that that idea of robotic manufacturing because this is going to be in such a remote location it's going to have to be done by robots and it'll be interesting to see how that all comes together so let's let's get into the idea the main idea a lunar crater telescope what is it Okay, so the main idea here is to build a telescope uh, on the far side of the moon inside a lunar crater by deploying a giant reflector. So if, if people in the, in the audience are familiar with the Arecibo telescope, uh, that's like the closest uh, analogy I can provide to the telescope that we are aiming to build. And the reason we want to build this telescope on the far side of the moon is because there are wavelengths uh, that cannot penetrate through Earth's ionosphere. So there are signals that are coming from the early part of the universe, before any stars had formed, before any galaxies had formed. Uh, the signals that were coming from the neutral hydrogen that the universe was made up of at that time, uh, that signal is so highly redshifted now that it is at wavelengths in the 10 to 100 meter range or at frequencies below 30 megahertz, and our ionosphere just does not allow these frequencies to penetrate and reach the surface of the Earth. So this so is the this is the this this hydrogen, <clears throat> I guess neutral hydrogen, occasionally pops out these photons at a very specific wavelength, and in fact, it it continuously does this. Right. It's, it's yes, it's called the 21 centimeter line. It's probably one of the most ubiquitous signals uh, in the entire universe because anywhere you have hydrogen, you have an emission at 21 centimeters. So that's the native emission, but by the time we receive it because of the large cosmological redshift, uh, it ends up being from 21 centimeters, it goes into 10 to 100 meter wavelength regime. Um, and that happens to be opaque, or the, the, the atmosphere of the earth is opaque to that form of radiation. Exactly. Right. So right. we have to go beyond Earth atmosphere to be able to measure the signal. And so you could build a telescope in space or you could build it on the surface of the moon. Uh, the additional advantage we gain from being on the surface of the moon is that we can actually use the moon itself as a shield against the Earth and as a shield against the sun. 
So our sun is also actually very active in radio. There are a lot of these different types of bursts that happen on the sun, type one burst, type two burst. So these radio bursts are things that are of great scientific interest, but they are kind of corrupting signals for this cosmological signal of interest to us. And similarly, as we know, the earth has so many sources of terrestrial RF noise. We have TV stations, we have uh, uh, all sorts of electrical components and motors, everything emits uh, some sort of electromagnetic radiation. So by being on the far side of the moon and observing in, during the lunar night, when we are blocked from the sun and from the earth, we can kind of reduce all these extraneous sources of noise and focus on the signal that, of, that is of interest to us. So how big of an observatory are you thinking would make sense? So we've evolved our design quite a bit over a period of time. So I think in the paper, we talk about a one kilometer size telescope. And since... <laughs> so I've been, wait reason... a second, wait a second, wait a second. Like, like Arecibo was, I forget, like 300-ish meters across. The fast mm -hmm. telescope in China is 500 meters across. Those are, are enormous telescopes that were very complicated to build. So just to put that in perspective, you would like a one-kilometer telescope on the far side of the moon. Yes, so that was, that's... Our baseline concept is building something on that uh, length scale. And we have to make it this big simply because the wavelengths are this large. So the size of any effective antenna is comparable to the wavelength that we are trying to observe. And oh. the reason why we can get away with small TV antennas or small radio antennas on your car is because the wavelengths we are looking at are much smaller or the frequencies are much higher. But if you want to observe a signal which is coming at 100 meters of wavelength or 50 meters of wavelength, then the telescope's reflector has to be at least a few wavelengths, uh, at least two or three wavelengths bigger than, uh, than the wavelength that we are trying to observe. And so that forces us to build a large reflector. Right. Okay. And, you know, like we're all fairly familiar with Arecibo, that it had this uh, a spherical shape. And then it had this instrument package that was positioned above and was able to then gather the the data coming from reflected off of the off of the dish. How would this be similar to to Arecibo or different? So it would be very similar in the sense we are also looking at a reflector which is parabolic in shape in our case. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then, and there are some nuances there as to parabolic versus spherical. Like ideally, you want a reflector to be parabolic because a parabolic uh, reflector does focus uh, all the beams uh, or all the rays at a single point, at least all the parallel rays coming along the axis. Whereas a spherical reflector doesn't truly do that. And so you have to put some correction in your feed to be able to account for that. But that's like a second level detail. Right, right, right. Um, but the but we do have a parabolic... Right. So, yeah. Well, I was going to say, like, the advantage of the spherical uh, reflector with Arecibo was they could move the instrument package to essentially point the telescope at the sky. Do you get that same kind of pointing ability with a parabolic setup? So, we, so that becomes harder for us. And in fact, we have no pointing in our telescope design. Our telescope will basically observe whatever is directly above it. So right. the only way our beam moves across the sky is when the moon moves yes. uh, or moves around the earth and eventually, and, and doing so goes around the sun. Yeah. That's the only way our beam moves across the sky. We cannot actively steer the beam, but we actually don't need to because the universe was basic, very close to being homogenous at that time. So whichever direction we look, we are still looking at the same signal. Right. Whereas Arecibo and uh, FAST and these other telescopes, they're often interested in looking at pulsars or mm -hmm. like radio emissions from specific objects in the sky. So for them, it's really important to be able to uh, move the beam to different locations. But for us, it's not a very critical requirement. And given the complexity of having moving mechanisms and lunar dust getting into the gears and other movable mechanisms, we decided to like not accept, not take up that risk in the design of our system. Right. So, um, and I guess in, in your case, the target you're looking at 
is the primordial hydrogen that is left over from the Big Bang before they turn into stars. So there won't necessarily be any object to look at. There will just be the beginning of the universe wherever the telescope is looking. Exactly. And again, uh, a small detail there is there are beginnings of fluctuations in this neutral hydrogen. Which and the, it is these fluctuations that actually grow and coalesce to form the first galaxies and first stars. But that's not the science that we are aiming for. That's also a very important question that we need to answer and understand: How do these fluctuations originate? How did they grow and and how did they how did they scale as time went on? But we are taking we are aiming to first take the first step of just measuring what was the temperature of this uh, of this signal like. Uh, if there is any exotic physics with the dark matter uh, behavior of the dark matter during that time, mm -hmm. because the universe had neutral hydrogen, but it also had dark matter. It had to have dark matter at that time. So if the cooling behavior is not commensurate with our current models of dark matter, that would be an incredible finding and would open up a lot of questions in terms of where exact, what exactly explains the state of the universe at that time. And what is your field of view? So the field of view of our system depends on the wavelengths. We are observing a very wide range of wavelengths, all the way from 3 megahertz up to 30 megahertz, and we are even considering expanding that to close to 45, 50 megahertz. So at 3 megahertz, our field of view is around 5 degrees. That's pretty big. Okay. Yes. And at 30 megahertz, our field of view would be around half a degree or so. Even so that depending is on pretty big. It is pretty big. So uh, compared to the, and, and it's very, again, it comes back to the whole wavelength question. It's very hard to get a very narrow field of view when your wavelength itself is very, very large. And so would you, I guess, over time, as the moon is moving and as this telescope is continuing to scan and the moon is, is on, you know, isn't perfectly lined up and it's shifting in and out of, of, you know, along its orbit, would you be able to build up some version of like an all sky survey of whatever is, is, is possible to see from this, this telescope? Yes. So I wouldn't call it all sky since we will not have complete coverage of the sky. If we did have the capability to steer, we could have potentially looked into the possibility of doing an all sky survey. And I think even that in itself is going to be incredibly, incredibly useful if we are able to do that, because just understanding uh, no one's really made this measurement of doing an all sky survey in these wavelengths because we just can't make those surveys from the surface of the earth. Uh, but we, we will cover, uh, we'll have a, a kind of a track. If you kind of imagine the universe, uh, spread out on like a globe, like the way we see in all these images from the cosmic microwave background and all that. So we have kind of a track so you can draw like a five degree beam width track that goes across this, um, uh, across the sky, this cosmological sky. So we will be taking measurements across that region. And we will actually, at some point of the time, also cross the galactic center. So we will, we will have the Milky Way come in our path at some point of time. And that will be a very difficult period for us because we have a lot of noise coming from the Milky Way as well that we have to deal with. Yeah. Uh, but it will trace some pattern across the sky, depending on where we locate the telescope on the moon. Right. Um... And, and so then, but I'm, but I'm assuming because the moon has these variations, like the moon is sometimes a little higher on its orbit, a little lower on its orbit, like you'd get a few degrees added over time, I would think. That is correct. That's a really good uh, point. So because of the nutation and the precession and all these other second order motions, if, if the moon were rotating in a perfect circle and the earth was going in a perfect, everything, if everything were perfect circles, then our tracks would just repeat over time. But because of all these additional motions that happen, our track will shift slightly from time to time. But the period over which those motions happen tend to be much longer. So like around 16 to 18 years or so. Mm, okay. um, and we are, we are aiming to only, we believe we can capture all the science goals that we have in a couple of years of operation on the moon. All right, so let's address the elephant in the room, which is how <laughs> like the the moon 
is very difficult, very expensive to get to. There are very few platforms that can even reach the moon at this time. You know, maybe the space launch system is going to be able to carry a few astronauts to the moon. Maybe Starship is going to be able to do it. How do you envision building a radio telescope that is bigger than the Earth's biggest radio telescope, but on the moon, on the far side of the moon, where you can't even see it? So I agree, and that is definitely a really big engineering challenge. And that's why I just want to emphasize this is not a NASA mission yet. Mm -hmm. This is still what we call a concept study, or it's funded by a program called NIAC, or NASA Innovative Advanced Concepts. And this is a program that NASA has where it can fund uh, ideas which may not be feasible in the next five years, but we can start looking into questions for some of these more ambitious ideas and like look at the feasibility and come up with in like innovative ways in which these could be accomplished in the future. Yeah. And so this idea of building a telescope on the moon has been around for quite some time. And if you did try to build it exactly the way Arecibo was built, I would agree that it's really not going to be feasible. You would have to transport hundreds of tons of material to be able to build it if you try to build it the same way as Arecibo did. But we are hoping to use a slightly uh, what we would like to call an innovative way of deploying this telescope is we are actually going to just suspend a mesh inside the crater. And that's why we need a crater which is appropriately shaped and appropriately sized so that we just kind of suspend a wire mesh inside this crater. And what happens is you don't actually need a continuously metallic surface to act as a reflector at these wavelengths. Even if your system has like a bunch of holes in it, if it's just like a wire mesh, it still acts like a good reflector as long as the size of those holes is less than a tenth of the wavelength that you're trying to observe, then it actually acts like a really good reflector. I mean, for instance, in our microwaves, we have a window by which we can look at what's how our food is cooking inside our microwave oven. Um, and so, but the radiation does not leak through those holes because the holes on your window are small enough that the microwave cannot leak through it. Mm -hmm. And using the same logic, we can just suspend a mesh inside a crater, uh, and it would then act like a really good reflector at the wavelengths that we are interested in. So how it's big still, would the gaps in the mesh be, do you think? So the smallest wavelength we are targeting is uh, on the order of uh, like 10 meters. So we can have gaps on the order of a meter. And mm. that's like the absolute highest gap that we could allow in our system, we would probably go down to even smaller, something on the order of 20 centimeters or 30 centimeters of gap between two adjacent wires in our mesh. So it's actually 20 centimeters, 30 centimeters is pretty big. So it's a pretty coarse mesh that we are actually going to spread out across the system. And because it is a mesh, it now can be super light or or not as heavy as one would imagine a telescope of this size being. And all we do is we just anchor this wire mesh on the rim of the crater. And by distributing loads smartly at different points in this wire mesh, we can make it achieve a parabolic shape. So you so let gravity do your building for you. Exactly. The It's the gravity. So... It's a very popular physics problem where if you suspend a wire by anchoring it at two points, it assumes a shape called a catenary shape, uh, which is not a parabolic shape. But if you change the mass distribution along this wire by adding small weights here and there, we can actually achieve a parabolic or any other shape that we want to achieve. So we've done a lot of structural design on our end uh, so that we can distribute the masses across this mesh in such a way that it achieves a, a, a parabolic shape, or at least a parabolic shape to the accuracy that we need for our application. Well, I wonder if the mesh itself, like just the thickness of the mesh, without having to put weights on it, if you just constructed the mesh very carefully, it would, it would, you know, by adding more weight to the various parts of it, making it more thick, it would be able to assume that shape. Exactly. So it's a combination of a lot of these uh, factors that we are taking into consideration in our design. So the mesh itself, you can vary its cross-section or its material that it's made up of to change the mass distribution. But at some point, it just becomes easier, just purely from an analytics perspective, to just add discrete masses here and there. And this idea is actually even currently used when we deploy large antennas on our satellites. So all these um, 
a big uh, synthetic aperture radar satellites that we have orbiting the earth and looking at the earth they often employ this kind of concepts where they kind of stretch out a membrane by having it tensioned at the edges and then kind of let it let a mesh assume the shape uh, by hanging a few weights uh, at different points along the along the structure oh, so we are basically planning to adapt a similar approach yeah huh okay um and so how much do you think this thing would weigh then so if it's going to be one big mesh that you'll try to deploy would you deploy it in one you know, like would you manufacture it here on earth in one piece and then stuff it in a stuff sack and carry it to the moon yeah these are all great questions so we recently concluded a very preliminary uh, kind of analysis to estimate our mass how how lightweight can we make our entire system and our estimate was that our entire reflector just the reflector part could be on the order of 400 to 500 kilograms that's not bad at all that's not really bad i know no. uh, i know initially again we've scaled down this is for a scaled down version of the system we are now looking at a 350 meter telescope so we did some analysis like it would be great to have a kilometer size telescope but to try to make it more feasible we said okay let's let's uh, see what we can do with the 350 meter telescope and it looked like if we shift our lowest frequency from 3 megahertz to 5 megahertz um then we are actually able to work with a smaller a uh, diameter telescope so for a 350 meter telescope we believe we can make our entire reflector be just uh around 400 to 500 kilograms in mass wow. and on top of this we need uh, a mechanism to deploy this and even there we've gone through a lot of different ideas and iterations uh, as you can imagine with these concepts in early stage there are a lot of ideas at play and we are we were comparing a lot of different approaches so for instance one approach was to use robots that would basically carry these like what we call lift wires which are anchoring our telescope on the rim of the crater they would carry them along the slopes of the crater anchor them on the rim and then come back down uh, but now actually since we have scaled ourselves down to 350 meters we think a projectile based mechanism might be a more feasible solution or a much simpler solution so you have a lander that lands on the center of the crater or the bottom of the crater and just shoots out anchors in different directions <laughs> so you can imagine it shoots out around 12 or 16 different anchors and once we have these lines set up with these anchors then we can kind of use pulleys based systems to kind of unfurl our entire mesh along these anchor lines and deploy our telescope that way how how you know craters aren't perfect circles they're rough circles how how much i guess um of a bad crater can you still use to get good science data again this is another really great question so we have an expert on uh, lunar regolith and lunar craters and all that on our team and he works uh, very he, he works a lot with data from lunar reconnaissance orbiter uh, so what he and a few other members of our team did is they did a survey of all the possible craters that met our criteria so firstly we know we need a crater of a certain size because our telescope is say 350 meters in diameter then we know that we want it to have the right kind of depth so that our entire crater can sit below uh, so, so we have the reflector and then we have a feed that is also suspended above the above the reflector at the focus and we want that feed to be below the height the the below the surface of the below the rim so that we can suspend it so that kind of gives us a minimum depth requirement for the crater then we want the the rim of the crater to be kind of clean we don't want there to be too many boulders or outcrops and things like that and then we want there to be a flat surface at the bottom of the crater so that a lander could land there and start the whole process mm -hmm. so we had all these different criteria and then we also wanted to be on the far side of the moon we also wanted to be close to the equator on the far side because then our our beam across the sky kind of co covers a bigger region of the sky so we gave all these requirements to uh, the person who was an expert in this area and they actually were able to find quite a few candidate craters oh interesting and okay and then we looked at the detailed images and the 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 depth profiles of these craters and we've chosen a crater for now that we are happy with and 
we have kind of fit, made sure our, our telescope fits inside the crater and looked at all the other properties of that crater. It does. I mean, it sounds like tricky work for robots to to deploy this. And I'm sure you'll iterate all kinds of of, of ideas. Um, but it also feels like almost the perfect mission for humans to do that if they're going to go to some point anyway, to go and and set up the posts and to then reel out the telescope across this, you know, it, it, I mean, a human could almost pick it up if it's, it's going to be a it, from their perspective, it'll just be, a, I guess, a couple hundred kilograms, not even less than 100 kilograms, 80. Kilograms. Yeah, because Right. So yeah, we, we I guess we haven't mentioned yet, like we are helped by the fact that the moon gravity is one sixth of Earth gravity. So a uh, four 500 kilogram reflector less does weigh less than 100 kilograms mm -hmm. on the surface of the moon. And that's why our anchors don't need to be as strong as you would think to hold a weight of 400 kilograms yeah. because it's now they're actually only effectively lifting 100 kilograms spread across 12 different anchors. So the moon gravity definitely helps us quite a bit uh, on this. But you're absolutely right. Um, we actually, there's a workshop next month on uh, science that could be enabled by the Artemis missions where astronauts are going to go to the moon. And we are attending that conference and presenting our ideas on how uh, astronauts could potentially help with deploying such a telescope on the surface of the moon. Uh, one, one, I think, point to note is that right now, none of the missions, human uh, missions, to the moon are slated to go to the far side of the moon for understandable reasons because right. you do need a you do need a relay satellite to constantly stay in touch with the astronauts uh, and our baseline uh, mission mission idea is to be on the far side of the moon so that's why we started off by looking at the robotic deployment option but we've been thinking about uh, the fact that a lot of these artemis missions are going to the south pole of the moon and if you are inside a crater on the south pole then you actually will probably still get a decent amount of RF shielding from so, being inside the crater. That's what I was going to bring up. I mean, you have these permanently shadowed craters at the south pole of the moon. They're going to be searching them for water anyway. And and if there's one that would that would match that size, then you would. But then you wouldn't get that that nice scanning of the entire sky. You'd be stuck with one spot. Yes. So. It, there is always a trade-off with these uh, kind of, uh, I guess, options that we have to work with. But I think I totally agree that if we are able to get the astronauts to deploy, it will retire so many of our risks. Because with any engineering deployment uh, kind of a system, there are a lot of risks built into the system. And uh, whereas with the active feedback that the astronauts are getting during the deployment process, they can adjust and they can... Uh, maneuver things in a much in a much better way. Um, so yeah, so I think we are really excited to actually carry out some analysis to see how well a crater actually shields us from the different sources of noise that we are concerned with. But otherwise, I think that would be a really good option for us as well. Yeah, yeah. So from a science point of view, you know, you talked a bit of you know, we talked a bit about this this time, you know, we're looking after the cosmic microwave background has been released. But before the first galaxies came together, what what things was the universe doing? Like, and give me a sense of time frame. Like, like what time regime are you hoping to be able to see in the early universe? So I've been working in redshifts for so long. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like we we define time in terms of cosmological redshift. Yeah, that I don't exactly remember now how many million years after a big bang that yeah. we are concerned with well give okay, me a red, give you... me a redshift number and I'll I'll convert it okay so we are looking at redshift 30 to 300 yeah so i know it's definitely less than 1 billion years after big bang yeah uh and maybe so i think it's on the order of a few hundred million years after big bang is yeah. when we are kind of interested in right right and and what kinds of things do we think the universe was doing during that period Yes, yeah, so as I said, not a whole lot. <laughs> In fact, that's one of the big reasons why cosmologists like this. They call it like astrophysics-free cosmology because they don't want their <laughs> cosmological signals to be to be disrupted by all these pesky galaxies and stars and all that are doing oh, other that's things. Really funny. And, 
and emitting all other kinds of radiation and all that. Here, this is the simplest la laboratory for you to test your fundamental physics because there isn't really a whole lot in the universe other than uh, like a giant gas of neutral hydrogen, yeah. a little bit of helium and dark matter and dark energy. That's all that there is in the universe at this point. So the uni all the universe is doing is it's just expanding. Uh, and as it is expanding, the I think the most interesting thing that's really happening is, as I was mentioning, there are these small fluctuations which are kind of slowly growing, uh, are becoming stronger and eventually collapsing into the first stars, into the first galaxies that form eventually. Right, right, right. So this is, but it really is a good way of understanding the really, really fundamental physics of dark matter uh, and the early state of the universe before we had all these complicating effects of stars and galaxies and all these other phenomena that started happening in the universe. So good news. Um, we're 20 years in the future and the NIAC grant has been, has gone all the way through. I have, uh, you know, seen into the future and not only that, you're going to get starship, uh, to be able to, to drop, uh, T hundreds of tons down onto the surface of the moon, if you like, and very clever robots. What, what do you see would be sort of like a dream version of this, of this telescope? What, what could be, you know, first, like what could be possible? And then what could we see? So the, my dream version would be a, the, I, I, I really see moon as a great infrastructure for radio astronomy in general. So, we are specifically targeting this science question and this science mission because it really just cannot be done from the surface of the Earth. But I think even having the kind of telescopes we have on Earth be on the moon would be a great resource because even though those might be frequencies you can observe from the surface of the Earth, like just observing them from the surface of the moon would be great from having a very clean, noise-free environment to carry out these measurements. But as I mentioned, uh, the, the telescope design we have right now is primarily aimed at understanding the just evolution of this neutral, the mm -hmm. signal of the neutral hydrogen. But we really would eventually like to study the structure, these structures that I was talking about. And to study those structures, you need a lot more collecting area and you need much longer baselines. So I guess I'm getting greedier mm -hmm. and I'm saying even a kilometer is not enough. <laughs> even a kilometer. Well, it's fine. I mean, you know, if it's if it's 500 kilograms for a for a kilometer, we could, you know, with several tons, we could definitely go into the 10 kilometer range. No problem. Yeah. Yeah. And, and when you start getting to those ranges, it may not actually necessarily make sense to have one single dish, which is 10 kilometers in size. And you would rather actually split this up into many, many smaller telescopes. Right. So you might have, say, uh, hundred such, hundred telescopes each of hundred meters in size, spread out so that they can collectively. Uh oh. <clears throat> Is that me? We have a large bay line and give you. Oh, you're back. Yes. Okay. Sorry, I think I lost. Yeah. I lost connection for a bit. Yeah. So you, so you, when last we talked, you had gotten very comfortable with the idea of this unlimited budget. And we're talking about, um, many kilometer sized radio telescopes on the surface of the moon. Um, that is, uh, you're, I think you're the first person who didn't fight me on this one. You just like immediately went to no problem. Here's what I'm thinking. So, um, so, so, so let's try that again. If you had, um, many of these telescopes set up on the moon separate, what could they do? Yeah, so they would be able to then capture the measure the structure of the universe. So there are different fluctuations at different size scales. There are small fluctuations. There are large scale fluctuations. How much of the universe's uh, matter is contained in the small structure, or how much of it is in the large structure? So basically, you can compare the what we call the power spectrum, 
uh, and really try to understand what is the spatial structure of the universe and more importantly how is it evolving yeah because that really then helps us kind of tie the two ends that we know about we know about cosmic microwave background and we know what happened when the stars had formed and galaxies had formed but how did it go from this state to that state to make that connection you really need to understand how the spatial structure in the universe evolved over time and i think with this kind of array of telescopes you would be able to do that and i should point out like lcrt is a single uh, reflector telescope concept but there are other researchers in this field like uh, specifically professor jack burns at university yep. of colorado yeah i've interviewed and, him as well yeah and so he has a lot of concepts where he has an array of dipole antennas uh aiming for the same goal that i just mentioned where uh you just are able to then capture the structure of the universe by deploying your antennas over a very large uh, baseline and there are additional science goals that become enabled when you start being able to do that like for instance you can look at the signals from exosolar planets uh, uh basically uh jupiter emits a lot of magnetospheric emissions or radio emissions uh in our solar system there's no reason to believe that uh planets in other system star systems elsewhere in the in our galaxy would not be doing that so we can actually look for signals that are coming from these exoplanets as well if we start making these large arrays which have the resolution yeah. and the collecting area that's needed to observe those kind of signals yeah i i like this idea of of detecting habitable exoplanets by their the emissions of their magnetospheres that it's like you get a it's a two for one you detect there's a planet and also you know that it has a magnetosphere which is very which is very helpful and and conducive for life do you think that you know like the search for radio emissions is very tied up with with seti for the search for extraterrestrial intelligence do you see a value in this kind of a setup for seti i mean i know you're looking you're specifically looking for neutral hydrogen you know given off a few million years after the big bang but are there other kinds of emissions that that we could detect that might be useful potentially other civilizations out there so my understanding is uh, the folks who are associated with seti are also aiming for the same signal the 21 cm signal since we believe that to be the most ubiquitous signal in the universe uh, it it makes a natural sense for them to look for that signal as well the only difference is we are looking for a very very highly red shifted version of this so if there were any civilizations elsewhere in in our solar or in in our galaxy right now or in other galaxies right now that were emitting uh, a 21 cm signal even if they are far away from us they would not be so badly red shifted so as to appear in the wavelength band of interest to us uh, or the wavelength band that we are targeting right now um but like having an infrastructure on the moon uh, like a reflector is a reflector and you could uh, potentially consider the idea of adding additional feeds so for instance we have one feed that is specialized for doing the science that we are interested in but you could do some smart rf engineering to incorporate additional feeds like when we've discussed this ideas with other uh, radio astronomers they've been like if you have such a big reflector on the moon we've got to do more things with it right that's what i'm thinking like there's more to the, but i guess for a construction side because you're putting those big gaps in it you're not going to be able to necessarily pick up the other wavelengths if exactly. you so so let's go back to my proposal of giving you the starship with the unlimited weight what if you made it a mesh that was you know millimeter gap instead of of meter gap would that allow no, you I, to look across many wavelengths it would allow us to look across much higher wavelengths uh because yes uh, our reflector mass will go up quite a bit uh, as you can imagine as your mesh gets finer and finer yeah but you are absolutely right it would allow us to look at higher wavelengths If we would need to go to much higher wavelengths to correspond to a 21 cm signal right now uh that wavelength is is pretty high i think it's on the in the gigahertz regime right now so we would have to go really high in frequencies to be able to capture that but i agree that just this concept enables a lot of other scientific explorations that could be done from the far side of the moon or from the surface of the moon in general and then what about making it steerable because because if you do have something that is i mean like 
like the magic I think of this idea is using these craters as a natural place to let a, a parabolic uh, reflector hang in this low gravity. And so if you went spherical, could you kind of go the Arecibo route and maybe make something that's more steerable? So like, if I did not have mass and cost limitations, I would yeah. totally want a steerable telescope compared to a fixed telescope. Right. There's no question about that. Even for the science that we are considering, if we had a steerable telescope, we could steer away from uh, the galactic center, for instance. We have a lot of emission coming from the stars and planets and other things in our own galaxy. So whenever the moon, whenever our crater will be pointed towards our galactic center, we will be just we will be swamped with a lot of RF noise. So it will really help us a lot to be able to steer away from that. But we thought the idea was uh, kind of outlandish enough at this stage yeah. that we wanted to minimize how many complexities we were adding to the system. But totally, if yeah. if you give me this uh, this freedom of being 20 years into the future and yeah. multiple starships at my disposal, yeah. I would totally want to have steerability in the telescope. And what about building an interferometer with the Earth? So having it join the Event Horizon Telescope, would that be feasible? That would be totally. In fact, we've often brought that up as a as a really uh, important possibility, even with a single LCRT, by doing this so-called very large baseline interferometry with telescopes on the Earth, we could really explore a bunch of other capabilities as well. Again, I mean, right now, at, at our current wavelength, it's not very relevant because there is no telescope on Earth that is working at those wavelengths. Yeah. But if we went to the moon, set up a telescope which is working at the same wavelength that we are observing from the Earth, you're now enabling really, really large baseline interferometry and the science possibilities there are really, really uh, amazing yeah. to, to ponder about. Well, it's really exciting. If people want to keep track of the work that you're doing, what's the what's the best place to do that? So we have a website called www.lcrt.info. Uh, and we've tried to do uh, a good job of compiling all our publicly available presentations and papers and talks uh, that RPI and others have given at different venues. Uh, and we have a contact uh, uh, a section that people can use to contact us. Um, we are always happy to hear from people and uh, yeah, uh, you can find anything. And if you can't, if, if there's something specific you're interested in, which is not there, please feel free to reach out to us and we'll be happy to answer any questions. Well, fant fantastic. Well, uh, Dr. Gould, it's a, it's a very exciting idea. I'm, I'm convinced I came in very skeptical, but, but once you gave me that, that, that mass amount, I've, I've turned around and I'm, I'm for it. So, uh, uh, I really look forward to, to this continuing on through the NIAC process and, and eventually turning into a, a proper, uh, instrument. That would be amazing. Thank you so much for taking the time. Oh, thank you very you. much. All right. Yeah. Thank you. This is really amazing. Thank Good you. Good luck. Take care. Have a good Bye -bye. day. Bye.